Let's pray together. Father, what a wonderful thing it is to approach you and to know that you are concerned enough about the needs of our life that you want to hear from us. But beyond this, uh, we're very aware of the fact, familiar in fact, with um, the reality that you are concerned not just at a distance, but that you walk alongside us in those concerns. There are times when it's very clear you've moved for our benefit. Things have worked out in terms of timing, in terms of those who are helping to provide the care or the measure. Of, of technology that's used in the treatment. Uh, all of those things uh, come into play in so many ways to, to help us when it comes to facing some of these physical challenges. This morning we pray for two who are um, representative of, of some special need. I pray for Judy and the circumstance with this implant that this would be successful for her and that it would truly be a, a wonderful benefit, a life-changing thing for her. I pray that you would bless the results of this effort so that uh, in her healing that uh, she'll be able to be uh, restored in terms of the benefit of being able to hear fully. And we pray for Pat, such a, a wonderful, sweet Christian lady who we love so much. And we pray that you would um, bless her with encouragement. I know this is a discouraging thing in terms of the outcome of this test. But, um, Father, we're, we're asking that you would move on her behalf and that you would allow this opportunity to be one that would just be evident to everyone that um, you have done this in the right timing in terms of the awareness of this, in terms of the procedure involved in helping to treat whatever might be necessary in the ongoing effort to help provide care for her and strength and healing. And we pray, Lord, that, that it would be evident that you have moved. And as we've prayed on behalf of so many in past requests and have seen so many benefits, our prayer would be that if it would be possible where technology or the efforts of mankind and their skills fail or fall short, that you would step in and fill that void and that you would make the difference so that it would be evident that you're providing care. We pray that you would bless this time together this morning. We thank you for the word and for the confidence we have in it. May our life and our service evidence the lordship of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. All right, I'm excited about bringing this message to you today. We're talking from uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Last few Sundays we've been together. Today we're going to get out of Deuteronomy 1, as I promised last week. We're going to go all the way to Deuteronomy 4. <laughs> so uh, you might want to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let me just kind of quickly set in context what's happening here. You know, we've already talked about the reality that the Hebrew people have come out of Egypt and they went through the 40 years of wilderness because of their rebellion. And as a part of that rebellion, Moses, uh, in part, on behalf of the people, but then also in some of his own personal actions, interacted on behalf of the people before God. And God told Moses, you will not go across the Jordan into the promised land because of your behavior. Even Moses was not fully appropriate in what he did and how he handled things. The period of wandering in the desert was not the most, um, I guess, educational in some aspects. You would think when consequence comes, people would pay note. But as is often the case, even perhaps drawn from our own life experience, as is often the case, when we're in that point of, of consequence, we sometimes tend to justify. We might say, well, I'm not as bad as the other guy. Or we might say, well, maybe the Lord's being a little unfair, a little heavy-handed in what he's doing here. I mean, good grief, an entire generation of people died in the desert in the account we're reading for Deuteronomy. So we could certainly say it was a pretty heavy and, and pretty hard type of, of uh, action against the people's rebellion. The thing is... We ain't done yet. <laughs> There's going to be more rebellion coming. It's, it's sadly the nature of mankind to be inclined to that type of rebellion. And we need a little get back in step kind of reminder every once in a while. Well, Moses is providing that. They've been through their time of wanderings. They have the promised land before them as God had promised. And, and they await going in. Moses tells the people, I cannot go in with you. The Lord's not going to allow that. So there's going to be a new structure of leadership in terms of, of your direction. However, you're going to be divided into different areas 
And before you in this land, as it was in the past, you're going to have laid before you a lot of moral decisions. So Moses reiterates to them the significance of listening to God's instruction and being obedient. He warns them of potential downfalls and says, listen, you can avoid this by following clearly what God has taught. We're going to look in, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy here in just a moment, Deuteronomy 4, picking at verse 23 and going forward. But what I want to do is I want to point back to an earlier message that I gave that talked about direction and talked about that insight with regard to uh, leaders and, and their calling. I want to point out that this now is very incumbent for us individually. It falls upon each individual follower of Christ to develop discernment. That's what wisdom does. It helps us to be able to see the pitfalls. It helps us to be able to determine the right course. And we can follow that course by our own cooperation, our own submission to the Lordship of Jesus. We can follow that course and avoid a lot of pitfalls, a lot of problems. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 4, again, verse 23 and following. Moses has already told them, here's what's important to know. Be cautious to follow this. I can't go before you. Verse 23 and following, he tells them, watch yourselves. Now, part of that's kind of like almost being a parent. You know, the, the kids are kind of getting out on their own now. And you've got to be careful. And so you want to warn them. That's a responsible thing to do. Moses is kind of doing that here. Watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. So specific in the text here, one of the greatest concerns is idolatry. We can't relate in the sense of a golden image that's out in our homes or in our yards or, you know, medallions that we have or that sort of thing in terms of idolatry. But in a general sense, we can still relate. Don't allow anything to misdirect the course of your life. Don't allow anyone or anything to redefine uh, responsibility and morality outside what God has defined it. Don't allow those distractions to pull you from the course of righteousness upon which you are set, your course you're following now. Moses says, don't go uh, cooperating with and following or worshiping idols. He goes a little bit further here. Why? Because the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. The statement in the commandments that God makes very clear is there is one God and I am He. There is no other God. Nothing made of stone or silver or gold or any other precious metals, nothing formed by the hand of man can compare to the godly qualities, the, the character and the nature of the living God of the Bible. So at the very onset, he warns us, don't be given to those distractions. Why? Because along with those distractions, there comes a change of heart, a change of mind, and inevitably, especially with idolatry, but as is the case with other distractions, inevitably, immorality is introduced. At the very least, there is a tolerance for immorality, which is just as bad. So the caution here is still the same. Now let's go just a little bit further in Deuteronomy 4, verses 25 and following, where he is actually calling for some humility. He's saying, listen, there's still a time to turn and be restored, to repent and have God bring you back into his good graces. Deuteronomy 4, 25 and following tells us of, of the shifting things that are going to happen around the people, uh, Hebrew people, and that are happening around in our culture as well. Beginning with verse 25. When you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly, a few generations have passed. You've come into the land of promise. You're settled in. You got your roots. And then all of a sudden you decide, uh, maybe it's okay to do this. <laughs> Start acting corruptly and make an idol in the form of anything. And do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess it. You shall not live long in it. 
but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. There you will serve gods, the work of man's hands, wood, stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Times change, don't they? The calling here, the urging here, which will be highlighted in verse 29 and following, we're about to read, is how God will respond when we humble ourselves and repent. He's already set before us the scenario. Bad things are awaiting in terms of the possibilities for your life. You could follow the things of the nations, or you can remain true. And it may even be, as he is projected here in Deuteronomy, when you're old. And your generation has gone and your children's generation has gone and their children now are coming in that things are going to shift and change and they'll start behaving or accepting things that I've condemned. And then he's very clear here. Moses is projecting God's word when he's saying, listen, God is not going to tolerate it. It may not come as swiftly as you think. It may not even come in the form you think. But God's hand of wrath his righteousness will be shown and His anger will be reflected in what happens and you will pay for your behavior. Now, that's easy to take this in and say, oh man, what a, what a depressive message. <laughs> what a horrible, depressing message. And, and we're talking about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Well, we're about to turn that donkey around. Let's get on a different course here. Let's pick up verse 29, okay? Because it reveals something wonderful and consistent about God through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Deuteronomy 4.29 and following. It says, but from there. Where? Among the nations. Fast forward to the New Testament. The, the story of the prodigal. The son who abandoned everything. Sold his inheritance. Squandered it all on harlots. Found himself begging for wanting the feed that he was given pigs. I mean, this guy had completely wasted everything. He came to his senses, and from there, in the hog walla, from there, among the idols, from there, in other words, there's a point in time when you can come to your senses, and the proper response is to return to God. It says, you'll seek Him, and you'll find Him. If you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul, when you're in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days, you'll return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. For the Lord your God is compassionate. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to them. Now, if you've been keeping track, that's three points that I've shared this morning. Most preachers stop at three points, but you think, I'm going to stop at three points? <laughs> this is where I would probably say, and now, uh, following the introduction, let's get into the sermon. <laughs> because of these verses, verses 29 through 31, that urge us to consider the compassion of God, because of these, let's look for some positive here, because there is a lot of it. And let's ask the question, if it's so important then to seek God, how do I seek Him? And if it's true that I can seek Him and He can be found, even in the hogwalla, in the depth of my depravity, in my sinful condition, doesn't it beg us, doesn't it compel us to reach out to Him because the condition of that hogwalla is not getting better? It's only going to get worse. But according to this text, even in the midst of that hardship and those struggles in the time of distress, if you seek Him, He is able to be found. So let's go there. Let's think about what it involves to seek God. First of all, I want to say that when we seek God, we should keep, just as a clarifying point, that in our pursuit of God, we will not follow after anything which contradicts what He's already revealed. God is a God of clarity, not a God of confusion. He doesn't delight in the, in the state of confusion that's going on in the world. He's provided clear terms for us, and they're unchanging. He's provided a clear moral 
standard or guide for us in the person of His Son, Jesus. And He has said, even in His compassion, I understand you're not perfect. I understand you're going to fall. But in our contrite brokenness, our repentant heart condition, if we return and in our humility we seek God with the understanding He's not going to tell us to do something that He's already spoken against, we're not going to find any contradiction. If we do this, He will find, He will be found. In James chapter 4, verses 5 and following, it said, Do you think the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. He gives a greater grace. If you could underline or highlight any phrase in your Bible, and you're looking for that phrase, maybe consider this one. The world doesn't offer grace. Maybe your friendships, your spouse, your employment, your education, the condition of your life doesn't offer grace, but God does. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You're double-minded. We are called to a life of cooperation with God, not contradiction. Now, I know it's trendy today in the culture to espouse a lot of things that are not found in the Bible. And the things that's, that's often kicked against, they'll say, oh, those are ancient. Uh, they're tradition. That's another thing that's said an awful lot as if tradition isn't good. <laughs> uh, it would be enough. If it were tradition, that'd be fine. But it's more than tradition. It is what God has said. And a lot of people like to kind of salve over the circumstances of their life by saying, oh, we're more sophisticated now, we know better. And what's talked about in the Bible, well, it's really not fitting for today's times. We're far beyond that. Well, listen, the Scripture here is saying you've got to come to a place of non-contradiction. If you're seeking God, acknowledge, recognize His revealed Word is what it is and it's unchanging. And we have to come into compliance with it. This is why... I and many others place such an emphasis on personal Bible study, the opportunity for you to learn from Scripture what God has stated, so you can know it's not just what your preacher says. You can know that God's saying this. Okay? Let's go a little bit further here, and let's talk about the value then of Scripture. Because if we're going to come into a place of compliance, we have to know what He expects, don't we? And fortunately for us, the Bible is clear, and it does it in a way that kind of like we talked about justice just a short while back, the two-edged sword that Lady Justice bears, well, in a similar way, the Bible's described as bearing an edge. Sometimes it cuts in a way that seems to wound us in the effect of bringing us to repentance. And sometimes it cuts in a way that prunes away from us those things that are found to be in contradiction with the Lordship of Jesus. The book of Hebrews tells us this. Hebrews 4, 12, uh, 11 and 12 says, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. So in other words... You can see already from past experience the bad decisions and what they've led to. Don't fall in that trap. How about let's be diligent in obeying and following so that we can come into that place of blessing and rest. It goes a little bit further. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I think it's pretty amazing that God has revealed to us His desired will. I think it's great that there's no ambiguity in His revealed plan. And I think it's wonder, wonderful that He entrusts us to have that place of agreeing with Him, cooperating with Him, complying with the Lordship of Jesus so that we don't contradict Him. Listen, if you're desiring to seek God, the Bible says He can be found. And it further affirms for us that God is not going to be found in a place where our life is contradicting what He has revealed in Scripture. So we have to know Scripture, don't we? 
If we know the Scripture, it helps us to determine, to discern those things which are in keeping with God's plan and those things which are not. But we don't stop there. The Bible in the book of Romans chapter 12 says, we're just taking a step further with regard to our personal commitment to Jesus. Verses 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, here's the benefit. We can see where contradiction exists. And we can help to change that. But the more we're in the Word, the more prone we are to submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus as a sacrifice. And then we're not conforming to those things that rebel against God. How do I seek God? Well, we seek Him by conforming, not to the world, but to the model He's shown us in Jesus. By having our thoughts and actions changed, transformed, the Bible says, renewed, so that we can evidence the Lordship of Jesus in our life. Rather than being in contradiction, we're found in cooperation. Now there's one more point. And that is the value of associating with other Christians. If you're seeking God, surround yourselves with people who are of the like-minded effort. If you want to learn to be the best welder you can be, you go to somebody that knows how to weld better than you. You want to be the, the, the best auto body person, you go to somebody that can show you what to do to repair, not cover up, but to actually repair and restore. You want to be the best baker or candlestick maker, you go to somebody that knows better so you can learn. And it's challenging, isn't it? I mean, when you learn to do these tasks, you don't learn how to do it overnight necessarily. It takes trial and error. It takes the effort and commitment that's necessary there. But if you're determined to do it, you're going to receive some benefit for this. Our association with other Christians is valuable. In fact, the Bible tells us in terms of a, a godly uh, relationship that iron sharpens iron. It tells us that our association and interaction with other believers is valuable. If you want to seek God, surround yourself with people who are wanting to find God as well, who are on that path of seeking Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just that first verse, Paul writes this, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. How many folks in this assembly can you turn to for assistance and encouragement, for guidance, for godly uh, wisdom and advice that will help in your course, in your walk of faith, in your submitting to Christ. And isn't it wonderful at times when you have someone who is such a trusted brother or sister in Christ that they can come to you and say, listen, I'm concerned that perhaps this decision isn't going to be in your best interest spiritually. Or can come to you and say, there's something that's being evidenced, that's, that's being shown, that's not in keeping with the Spirit of Christ. And what can I do to help you, to prune that away, and to strengthen you, so I can walk alongside you, not in a condemning way, but in a way that helps bind you, and helps lift you up, and strengthen your legs, so that you can stand in Christ. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. As I follow Him, follow me. That's what the association, the fellowship of Christian with Christian produces. The opportunity for us to learn and to grow, to be accountable to one another and help one another to be strengthened. If you're wanting to seek God, make sure you're surrounding yourself with people who are godly people. Now, that goes in a lot of ways in terms of our relationships, in terms of our friendships, Sometimes we can't control it in terms of employment, that sort of thing. But we still do the absolute very best we can to surround ourselves as much as possible with folks who are helping to compel us to be stronger in Christ. That is valuable. The reality is when we seek God, it involves our initiative, our effort, our decision. We have to look and see, using godly discernment, is my life contradicting what God has revealed? Or is it actually cooperating with God? 
He's promised if I pursue Him and seek Him with all my heart that I can find Him. Jesus even stated this. And if that's the case, then am I doing everything I can to make sure that I'm in compliance with the Lordship of Jesus? And it shows. And am I surrounding myself with people who are like mind? And am I doing my best to encourage them to follow that same course? You see, the fact is it takes effort on our part. It doesn't happen overnight. It isn't by osmosis. Our pursuit of God, our seeking God, is one that is an ongoing daily thing. And our association makes a big difference. I'm thankful for the body of Christ I'm thankful for the encouragement that God is a gracious God and even in the midst of that hog wallow of sin and unrighteousness and rebellion and contradiction, that God's grace, His compassion is available. The question is, are we seeking God? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for the clarity with which You have laid out for us a course of faithfulness it's easy for us to see by the life of Jesus what perfection is. And we can't attain that. But it's also easy for us to see, even in the pages of Scripture, where there are well-meaning, faithful people who, even in their stumbling, did the best they could to be restored to Christ and faithful living. Thank you for giving us this fellowship of believers and the opportunity for us to be able to worship together and encourage one another in the Word to Pray for one another and help one another when we're facing discouragements or t real tough times or challenges that catch us unaware. Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it so that we can help to compel others to mature and to grow and develop even greater faith in Christ. That's our goal. That's what we want. And we want to be a shining light so that other people who are seeking you can see the difference the Lordship of Jesus has made. And that light would shine in such a way that it would be attractive. Thank you, Father, for the blessing you've afforded for us and being a part of your family to agree with you and to adopt us into your family according to your terms. Guide us and help us in our efforts to be a blessing to your kingdom. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.